All right. So excited to be here. I've known about you guys for a long time, and uh, I think I'll just duplicate the the day long seminar since this is the second service, and nobody has any plans at Lambo today, right? Do they? Not the oh wow groans already, right? Oh, circle of life, right? It'll come around at some point. Uh, I am glad to be here. Um, my wife Jenny wishes she could be here. We go to we live in DeForest, and that's where we fellowship. But she was asked to lead worship on this same day in Sun Prairie at a church there in Sun Prairie. So she is uh, she is exercising her gifts there. Um, I was talking to Roger earlier. Both of us have outkicked our coverage when it comes to our wives. Uh, you don't have to be convinced of that because you know Sandy. Uh, if you've met Jenny for 30 seconds, you would understand that that's the truth with my wife as well. So um, it's a kind of a fun day for our family as we're all in different places, though. My my oldest is in La Crosse. He's fellowshiping at a, at a great church there. He works with a youth group. Uh, our next son, Alex, is uh, giving his testimony probably right about now at the church that he's at as he goes to the university in Whitewater. And my daughter is probably just rolling out of bed. She said she wanted to join me for both services, but she was up at 3.30 yesterday morning and didn't get home until 9 o'clock. She had a a show choir event, and she had all the best intentions. Her heart is here, and I wish you could meet her as well. So, yeah, it's uh, been a crazy year in the last year for us uh, with our with our automobiles, our family has single-handedly decided to uh, support the family of the owner of uh, DeForest Collision and Repair. Just a little extra ministry that we have on the side. He's got six kids. We do what we can. So all of us actually have vehicles. So we have five vehicles. Um, and as of uh, Tuesday, we haven't had any problems since Tuesday. We actually put another $300 into one of the vehicles. Yeah, they go back. Uh, one car is from the uh, Clinton administration. Three of the cars are from the W administration, and mine is from the, the first term of Obama. So we, uh, we joke that we're in the 700 Club. You've heard of the 700 Club, right? Well, we're in the 700,000-mile club, I think, when you add up all our miles. We're at least at 700,000 miles. But, uh, yeah, so one of the uh, days my car was it was my... My car's turn to be in the shop, so I borrowed my wife's van. She didn't need the car for the day, and uh, so I thought being a good husband, trying to score some points, we do that, ladies, um, I thought, well, the car's kind of a mess. I think I'll take it to Octopus Car Wash and and bless her with a clean car inside and out. It's always nice to have somebody do that for you, and so uh, as I, I jumped out of the car, let them take the car through the car wash. I don't like to waste a whole lot of time uh, doing things. I like to at least be productive even when I'm not doing anything. And so I'm one of those guys that wears one of these. I'm not like expecting a call every time. I just like listening to podcasts or teaching or music. You know, So I th- thought I'd throw this in my ear as my car was being washed and catch up on the latest teaching. So, so I let go of my van. I start listening to something. And then uh, not long after, I get a phone call. I'm like, all right, hit the Bluetooth and... Start talking to my friend Mark. Mark said, hey, I, um, I know that you've helped me and my wife a lot in our marriage, but our daughter is having some anxiety issues. She's got some allergies, and she had a bad reaction, and now she's really freaked out about eating. And I thought maybe with, with what you guys do, it could be helpful to her. And so I start talking to him a little bit, asking him questions about the situation uh, while my car is going through. And, you know, if you've ever, ever been to an octopus, you can see your car kind of going through. And so... Uh, I'm, I'm talking to him, trying to understand the situation, and then the phone cuts out. I lose the call. I'm like, can you hear me now? Mark, what's, what's going on? And I, I was confused because I looked at my phone, and the timer was still going. You could still see the call time. I'm like, what? I'm, okay, checking my... The light's on. Everything's cool. Volume's up. What happened? I look at my phone again. It, the timer's still going. All right, well, I stop the call, and I, I call him again. For a few seconds, I'm, I'm on the phone with him, and then pfft, cuts out again. Like, what? What is going on? And so I decided, okay, well, this thing ain't working. I can say ain't here, right? <laughs> I am educated. But um, 
I call without the Bluetooth on, and I'm like, Mark, sorry about that. Ah, uh, what was happening? He's like, I was, I know you're at Octopus right now, but it was like I was in the car wash. I'm like, oh, that's funny. And then it dawned on me what happened. He was in the car wash. We've got a Bluetooth in our van, and it transferred from here to inside the van. So he's here in the car wash, <laughs> and I'm hearing nothing. <laughs> and so I just thought, wow, what a great illustration. Before I, take, I get used to that. That'd be weird to preach with that the whole time. Uh, wow, connection. Don't we all want to be connected to our Creator to keep that connection? The Lord never loses His connection with us, but there are things that get in the way of us losing our connection with Him. And that really is a huge part of what we do in our ministry. It's not about how smart I am and how I can download what I know to somebody else. It's really about what Jesus says in John 8. We're not going to take a whole lot of time to delve into all the context of what was going on in that passage. But in John 8, verse 32, you guys know it well. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. A little bit later in the passage, Jesus says in verse 36, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So I want to take some time this morning and this afternoon and into the evening. Right? No. Uh, to talk about three words. Know, truth, and free. What does it mean to know? Well, we can know informationally certain things. We can get smarter about things. Some of us are kind of smart in our biblical knowledge. Kind of smart in some of the principles as, as Jesus followers that we should know. But what Jesus is talking about here has so much more to do about experientially knowing. There's a huge difference between... because. I've had three kids go through driver's ed and them sitting in a class and knowing things. You have to know things to be able to drive a car. But the rubber really meets the road when they get behind the wheel, correct? You don't know how to drive just by sitting in a class. You can be informed on some of the, the rules and the laws, but it's not until you actually are behind that steering wheel that you really start to understand and experience what it means to drive. So this experiential engagement with Jesus, that's what he's really interested in. The title of my message is The Lopsided Left. And if, I, if that's in your bulletin, some of you might, thought, might have thought, oh, what kind of political statement am I making today? Uh, none. So either that disappoints you or not, what I'm talking about is how our brain works and how we know things. The Lord has made our minds very, very complicated and yet it's, it's very simple, too. You talk about the simplicity of things. There's different ways that the brain works, and I paint with a broad brush. I've never done brain surgery. I think what we do is mind surgery at our ministry, but the brain works in many different ways. And one of the ways it works is it actually works up and down. It actually works forward and backward. And it also works left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left. The left side of the brain is the logical, analytical, rational side of our brain. That's the safer side of our brain. So when you learn a principle, when you learn Scripture, when you learn anything, that's where most of it lives. I spent my time at a, in a great youth group, in a great church, a great Bible school, and in a great seminary. And by the time I was done, I walked around lopsided with all this information. Right? Some people call seminary cemetery <laughs> because you can die just only focusing on the lopsided left. But the, the word says, taste and see that I am good. Not just think about it, consider it, taste it, see it. <laughs> right? Like a big juicy piece of fruit. That's what, he wants us to dive into him and to be trusting of who he is. You know, even just the word believe doesn't quite say it strongly enough to trust him, to put your hope in him. He wants us to do that. And he gives us reason to do so. When my daughter was in seventh grade, she was transitioning. She'd, she'd done public school. Then we pulled her out because of some situations. I did homeschooling for a while. 
And when she transitioned back into seventh grade, she had dance going on and she had some clubs she was in and she was just kind of overwhelmed by all the things happening in her life early on in, in that seventh grade experience. I was downstairs in our bedroom. My wife was gone, boys or wherever they are. She comes downstairs and she says, Daddy, how do you spell appreciate? I'm like, well, that's random. So I, I spelled it out for her. I'm like, well, why, why do you want to know that? And she's like, well, Mom asked me to clean my room and I just have been so busy and I, I just didn't have time to do it. And she really was. She was really busy. And Jenny, recognizing that, cleaned her room for her. Didn't want to make it a practice. But she cleaned her room and, and Bryn just came into her room and saw how clean and tidy her room was. And it just filled her heart with gratefulness. So she wanted to write a note. Like she couldn't help but write that note. It wasn't my wife saying, you know what, I cleaned Bryn's room. She better appreciate You better tell her how much she should appreciate it. It just was there. And that's the kind of relationship Jesus wants to build with us. He wins us over by his love. He wins us over as we open the door to our heart in some pretty painful places. He wins us over so we can't help but to be grateful and changed. That's what I'm interested in. So there's the word no, there's the word truth. And all truth is God's truth. Our left brain can know that, because I believe that. And truth is everything that is in in accordance with fact or reality. The left side of our brain, still, as much as I was tipped over like this, I think about what my left brain believed 20 years ago, and I'm in a different place. I think that's probably good for all of us to be sharpening our understanding of what what God is trying to communicate through His Word, through His Spirit. So those things should sort of continually be growing. But truth is more than just those concepts. As, As Jesus is explaining this, what He's really trying to tell them, it's not just about the principles. It's not just about the concepts. He is saying, I am the embodiment of truth, right? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some people have said that after he says, I am the way, because there's not a whole lot of uh, grammar and punctuation in the Greek language. I am the way, colon, the truth, and the life. Truth is a person. We get to follow a person. I can't have too much of a relationship with a concept. I can play around with that in my mind. But I can have a relationship with a person through the power of His Spirit. So that's the kind of truth that I want to experience over and over. Then there's this word freedom, which really means an absence of anything that restricts us. And when Jesus is talking here in John 8, He probably is talking to some extent about sin. There was really no understanding from that mindset. In the Old Testament, it was constantly trying to do things. And constant sacrifices. Our men's group on Thursday mornings is studying the book of Hebrews, and I'm coming more and more into an appreciation of that mindset they had and the writer of Hebrews trying to tell them, hey, this is different. Jesus was a sacrifice once for all. That's the kind of freedom that he wants to give us, but not just for our sins. I think Jesus died on the cross not just for our sins, but for all of our hurts, our pains, all the things that we carry. Hebrews 12.1 says, hey, let's consider those things that so easily entangle us and the sin that holds us back. Let's consider those things and see what that's about so that we can be set free of those things. So I think when we trust Christ, we are free, and yet not a whole lot changes in our thinker. I think our spirit is given the Holy Spirit in a way that we never knew before. And that Spirit is alive and free. And the Holy Spirit has perfect residence in that place. But that that decision to trust Christ like that doesn't necessarily change the pattern of thinking that Romans 12 talks about that we need to be renewed in. So I just want to give you some examples of what that really looks like. But first, I want to try to explain this. Let's just say that the water that's in this bottle here is truth. 
We agree that if this is the Lord Himself, if this is some teacher that we can respect and we want to pour into, or some friend that's been walking with Jesus for a long time, they've got some information here that that would help us along the way. And so here I am. Okay, yeah, I want you to pour some truth in me. And just get some of that in me. That's what I need right there. Get some truth in me right there. That was so good. Did you? That guy that got up and spoke, that woman that gave that testimony, wow, that was really awesome. It's really good. Uh, well, didn't really get a whole lot in the bottle there, right? Well, maybe if I do this, I'll unscrew the cap a little bit more. Yeah. I'm a little more open than I was before. Let's get in a little bit more. Yeah. Maybe a little bit as I wet myself here. <laughs> oh, now I can drink that in. The problem isn't with the giver of truth. It's with the receptor. The Bluetooth, right? That gets disconnected. I want to position myself in a way where that cap is open to whatever the Lord wants to do in my life as much as possible. So as I successfully wet myself, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how this ministry came to be. Uh, back in the late 90s, it was, uh, it was a great time at our church. We were growing. I was a youth pastor. I was actually the associate. I was Anybody who was 35 or under, they were my responsibility. And uh, I enjoyed that to some extent. Um, And our church actually had a beautiful vision. It was a vision of bringing charismatics and evangelicals together. And Pastor Dick Sisson, some of you might be familiar with him, an amazingly gifted person who has a huge heart for Jesus and and an evangelistic heart, wanted to bring those two worlds together in a beautiful way. And there was a time where that was just, it was a lovely, beautiful thing. And a few years into it, there was a seminar, workshop thing going on in Iowa. It was a spiritual warfare seminar. And I already had plenty of irons in the fire. had youth ministry, had young adult ministry, kind of oversaw the kids' ministry as well, and had two little boys at the time. And I had no interest whatsoever in being a part of getting uh, into a van and driving to Iowa at this point to go to some spiritual warfare conference. I'm like, yeah, God bless you. Well, our church had two vanfuls of people that went to that seminar. And one of the uh, people that went that was sort of spearheading it was uh, Leo Brown. Leo was a um, former missionary to India, pretty much seen it all, at least to that point, and uh, was just finishing a, a, a master's degree in counseling and in neuthetic counseling, which is basically you take what the Bible says and apply it to whatever people's problems are. And then the more you understand your identity in Christ, the better you're going to be. A lot of this left-sided kind of stuff, but it was beautiful because it's truth. God's truth at whatever is is beautiful, right? So he's just kind of got his arms around that way of helping people. Well, as they, uh, as people go to different breakouts, workshops uh, that weekend, the buzz was around this one workshop. And it was called Theophostic Prayer Ministry. Some of you might have, might have heard that. We don't even call it that anymore. We call it transformational because of the goofiness of a word. But Theo is God. Phos is light. It was basically a way to describe how God's light can penetrate deep in our hearts. One of the stories that Dr. Smith tells is uh, he was in church ministry and then he left church ministry to have a counseling ministry. And... Uh, Without trying, what happened was there were people, women especially, who were incest survivors. And he decided to develop a support group so that these women could get to know one another, some of their struggles, and to be ministered to one at a time within the context of a group. And as they would be ministered to by Dr. Smith, he knew what they needed. He knew that ultimately they needed truth. So they would go through this process of going to the pain, going to those experiences, those places that we try to protect. We don't want to go there, right? We, we want to stay away from the pain as much as possible. In fact, more than we think, we try to manage our pain in such a way that we will never go there again. Why would we dig that stuff up again? 
these women were willing to do that. And as one woman in particular would go to this memory of her dad doing uh, anything but protecting her, which is what God's plan is for a father, hurting her deeply as she was reliving, re-engaging in that pain, all the shame, all the guilt, all the fear, all the rejection, she would feel that every time. And when Dr. Smith would do his counseling, as she was feeling that, or every one of those women felt that, he would then tell her the truth. You're not there anymore. It's not your fault. You're not shameful. You're not guilty. You don't need to be afraid. And as he would tell them that, they would come out of those painful places and go, you're right. I'm not there anymore. I'm not guilty. I'm not shameful. But if she were to go back into that place, it all comes back up again. So sometimes all we do sometimes, well-intentioned as it may be, we just give people really good lids to put back on top of the pain. Jesus wants to meet us in that pain. So, Dr. Smith was reading through Scripture, and he was reading through John 8. If you know the truth, the truth is going to set you free. He said, God, that's your word, that's Scripture, that's inspired. I believe it. I don't believe it. Because I'm not seeing it. you got to show me. i got to see it. And so, that prayer started a work of the Holy Spirit in Dr. Smith's life. And he started showing Dr. Smith some insights of maybe the best thing you can do for these women is to get out of the way. So, when this woman came in again, he said, you ready to go to the pain? She said, yep, let's do it again. He said, but this time, would you be okay if we did something different? She's like, anything. I'm so tired of retreads, going through this over and over again and not really getting very far. So she went back into the pain identified those lies, and then instead of him telling her the truth, what a novel idea. He said, you willing to have Jesus deal with that? So she opened her heart up to Jesus. And as she was in that pain, she sat there for a while. A smile came across her face. She opened her eyes, and she said, it's gone. He said, what's gone? She said, the pain's gone. He's like, what? Well, Jesus told me I'm okay. I've told you that. And she looked at him and said, Ed, you're not Jesus. Oh, that's the difference. He can meet us in that right side of our brain that carries all that pain. We've got the logic. We've got the rational, analytical part of our brain. But over here on the right side is where we carry our pain, our emotions. There's creativity. There's all these things here. Jesus is the only one who can really make a difference here. So that piqued my interest as Leo would kind of download some of the things he was learning. And one of the first people that he saw after going through that training, buying the manual, reading these things, was a gentleman that would have panic attacks on a regular basis. And whenever this gentleman in the past would have panic panic attacks during a session, Leo would just say, hey, walk that thing off. We're going to get back into the scripture here. We're going to go through maybe Ephesians 1. Ephesians 3, talk about your identity, what transpired when you trusted Christ, those kind of things. And just just walk it off until you're done and then come back here. Well, the guy had a panic attack at the at the it was the Tuesday after this the seminar. And and Leo with uh, just a fundamental rudimentary elementary understanding of what these principles were said, Would you be willing to do something different? All right as he went back into that anxiety that he was feeling, Leo said, would you be willing to feel and just, if I prayed and we asked God to help you get to where this is really coming from? Because it's not really coming from your your current stuff. Whatever. So he, we, they prayed. Jesus helped him get to this place where as a little boy, in the middle of the night, the neighbor lady ran in the house screaming, Johnny's dead. Johnny's dead. Johnny was his best friend who lived across the street. And so this boy that was sitting in Leo's office, (laughs) when he goes back to that memory, feels 
so lost, so fearful, so confused. What can you or I do in that situation 30, 40 years later? Give them some scripture that, that's true? Or, as Leo said, you willing to just let Jesus do something here? Yeah, whatever. So he opened his heart up to Jesus as he was engaged in that pain. And Jesus met him in his little bedroom and said, it's going to be okay. Yeah, Johnny's gone, but I'm with you. Whew. All the fear, all the pain disappeared. Never came back to that place. And last I heard, he'd never had another panic, panic attack again. I wish it always worked that simply. That's not always the journey with people, depending on their level of trauma. It's kind of like this. Now, earlier I used the water to illustrate truth. So just kind of switch your minds over. Let's say this is the right side of your brain. And all the water in there are the lies that we believe. Okay? So sometimes we'll just visit that and go, go, leave, in Jesus' name. Not a whole lot happens, right? But when people are willing to engage and squeeze and invite Jesus into that place, it's amazing what He can do. And in one session or in one moment, a lot of that hurt gets squeezed out. And people call me up and say, you know what, I'm good for a while. And then I'm, they might come two or three times. I love it when they, they come two or three times, deal with some of the core stuff that's rooted in things that are way beyond the current situation, and they'll come back and the Lord says, okay, let's do a little bit more twisting this way. And then maybe they'll come back again. There's more twisting. Because this is a lifelong process of sanctification and what Jesus wants to do in us. I'd much rather just say, Lord, change me. That stuff over there. But it seems like, from what I understand, Jesus is really okay with our hurts and our suffering because he was willing in the garden to say, I'm going to be an obedient son. Is there any other way? Jesus asked for another way. Could it be, you know, can you just do this legal injection, lethal injection kind of thing? That's, God could have chosen lethal injection instead of the cross, the brutality of the cross, but he didn't. And so all the pain, the suffering, not just physically, but what it meant to have every sin, every hurt, every pain, spiritually, emotionally, on the body of Jesus. I can't even go there. So, to talk about uh, a little bit more of our process, we, uh, we call it the melt process. It's easy for people to understand. What's important when people come to us is to realize that it's not about me giving them advice. It's about them stepping into whatever that pain is. And so MELT stands for memory, emotion, lies or false belief, and then truth and transformation. Memory is important because it's the container where we've had our experiences. And that's where those lies from the enemy or even ourselves are embedded. And that's where Jesus wants to meet us in those places. i got to kind of have to run through here a little bit quicker uh, this, this morning. It's, it is a eight-week seminar we're trying to do in 35 minutes or so. Uh, so memory is important because it's how we can measure things. To go back to those places and find that there's still freedom there. It's a great way that God has created our minds to be able to test that. Emotions. God gives us our emotions as a barometer. Some of us don't like our emotions. I grew up with the model that it's a train. You've got the, you've got the engine, you've got the cars, you've got the caboose. The engine is fact. We really have to stick with fact. And those cars are the faith that we have. We want to cling. Our faith should be attached to truth, right? should be attached to fact. And then the caboose is feelings. The way it came across to me, whether it was what was said or just how I took it, was those feelings, those emotions, not only should they be the caboose, they should be way at the other end of the tracks. Because if you're feeling anxiety, you know what? You're not walking in this. You're not doing something right. So just shut those thing down, things down and just live by faith in the facts that you know. You know, that helps some people as a, as a band-aid for a while, but it's not the truth that sets us free. It's just a good crutch to help us limp along. Jesus didn't say to the man who was crippled, hey, I got some uh, physical therapy planned for you. There are going to be some nice crutches that you're going to hop along with for a while. He said, pick up your mat and walk. 
That's the kind of Jesus that I want to continually get to know better and better and better, is to pick up your mat and walk, not let's hobble along together a little bit more. So those emotions alert us to a problem. It's like a kid that wants to put his finger on a hot stove. Put that finger on a hot stove. He probably only needs to learn once, right? If it wasn't for the feeling, the ability to know that it's hot, you'd just keep your finger there and it would melt your finger off. So those feelings, those emotions are important for us because it shows us where we're really at and where Jesus wants to fix us in our hearts. Those, Yeah. Okay. No, I'm trying to do it by 1145. I know you know i got a lot of stuff going on here. Oh, no, I was actually thinking 1130, and I'm thinking I'm already over. So there. So those emotions are a dead giveaway to what we really believe. And then there's the lies and false belief um, that live in both sides of the brain, but the brain is the only place Jesus can touch. So memory, emotion, lies, and then truth and transformation. That's God's job, and that'll be illustrated a little bit here. So I'm going to skip ahead and just give you an illustration about what is true belief. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We can believe things, but not really believe things. Let's just say, just after the service here that ends at 1145, somebody, <laughs> that they're flex. All right. <laughs> I'm like, man, I am just jonesing for a burger. Anybody know a good place to get a burger? And somebody says, oh, yeah, New Glarus Burgers. It's on 5th and Main. You're going to love it. Okay, I'm like, oh, I start salivating already. Huh? Ready for a burger. I, I, I walk just about out the door, and somebody says, hey, what you up to? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going to New Glarus Burgers on 5th and Main. I can't, I can't wait. And that person says, what are you talking about? There is no such thing as New Glarus Burgers. I don't think even 5th and Main cross in New Glarus. What are you talking about? What? And I don't have my GPS. I don't, I'm like, yeah, they just told me to go here, take a left, and then a right. It's going to be great. Okay, so I'm kind of conflicted here. You know what? I'm just going to get in my car and see. Otherwise, I know there's a Culver's down the road somewhere, right? You just have to run into one of those. So I drive. I follow those directions from the first person that told me where New Glarus Burgers was. And I go in. New Glarus Burgers. Wow. I go in there. And I just chow down on the best burger I've ever had. Slop it all over my shirt as a memory. I remember that thing. Okay, let's say I come back uh, next time I'm here, and that person that told me there was no new Glarus Burgers on Fifth and Main, and was like, "Yeah, ha, that's a joke, right? You, did you really go?" And he tries to convince me there's no new Glarus Burgers on Fifth and Main. Can that guy now convince me? No way. Was I a little shaky when he first told me? I was, but because I had that experience, I cannot be talked out of it. If somebody tries to talk you into something. Somebody else can talk you out of it. But if you have an experience with Jesus like that, that's rock solid. It can't be changed. So just a few examples of what I've seen. I wish we had till noon, but we don't. So go to our website. <laughs> a good friend of mine who I had no idea struggled with alcohol, and he always had a toothpick in his mouth or chewing gum. As we went through the process, the memory, emotion, lies he identified, inviting Jesus into those places to bring truth, where sometimes people see the Lord in those painful places. Some people hear the Lord. Some people just get this sense that Jesus is doing something through his spirit. After doing ministry with him, his jaw dropped. It had been clenched for almost 15 years because he was always trying to fight, not drinking. Uh, ministry in Nicaragua to uh, ministry of... Uh, People, women who have been in prostitution trying to get out. Uh, a woman who was in prostitution got out. Her daughter went into prostitution, came out. Her mom sent her back into prostitution and got murdered. The pain that was there, the guilt that she carried, went through our process not only with that event, but some stuff that was in her past. She has freedom now. She does not carry the guilt and shame. It is gone. Uh, a pastor there in Nicaragua who is a child Watch somebody killed with a machete, eight years old, hiding out underneath the table as, as, as a man was murdered. The fear that that set into that pastor's heart, that particular fear is gone. Uh, a man who grew up with a very violent father that would strike him and his brother at the dinner table caused him later to, when he would ever go out to eat or at another person's house, would, would 
hold himself together and, sh- and try to hide the shaking that was going on inside of his heart. As Jesus met him in one of those places where there was violence in the home, he says, I no longer, he says, I no longer shake. It's been over 10 years for him. Um, a woman after uh, facing the pain of having an abortion couldn't stand being around little kids because of the association with little kids and her abortion. After stepping through a lot of pain in that, she now is around little kids and can't believe she doesn't feel that same pain again. A woman who was who lived the life of Cinderella with a stepmom who was torturous to her, years later would have night terrors that she couldn't shake. Every night she said, I had night terrors. Her night terrors are gone because of what Jesus did in her heart. Uh, so many other things. A lady that uh, was abused constantly by her father. Uh, one of those memories that she went to was when she was a little girl doing the dishes. He grabbed her and abused her. And for the rest of her life, she hated doing dishes. After dealing with that particular experience, she, says, she sent me an email with a picture of the dishes. She's like, I did these dishes in peace. It's not about the dishes. It's about the peace in her heart. Uh, working with a uh, survivor of the Las Vegas shooting. I don't have time to go into all of that, but one of the places she went to was her friend that, as the as the bullets were being fired, her friend jumped on top of her to protect her. She felt guilt over that because she put her friend in danger by not being strong enough. She saw Jesus covering both her and her friend. I'm protecting you both. The guilt of putting her friend in danger lifted. She's in a different place now. A veteran who, on Veterans Day 14 years ago, his tank was blown up. He saw friends burned to death and how that haunted him. The pain that was there, he hated November. He especially hated Veterans Day. And he said, this past November, I just walked through November with freedom. All I thought about was, what, what are we doing for Thanksgiving? Just had lunch with him and his pastor on Thursday. Those are the kind of things that we look for. We look for the person of Jesus. So as I close, there was a chaplain from Oral Roberts several years ago who gave a message and, and quoted 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Ooh, wouldn't it be great to unpack that, right? It is about the Lord. We're boasting about the Lord. We're not boasting about cross counsel. But then he says, I do not believe in redemption. I do not believe in healing. I do not believe in deliverance. And I do not believe in salvation. As the crowd gasped, he said, this is what I do believe. I believe in a redeemer. I believe in a healer. I believe in a deliverer, a savior, and much, much more. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being that in us, that you delight in that, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and how we can experience your truth, not just know it in our heads, but know it in our hearts as well. So thank you for every person here in the ministry of Grace Church. Thank you for how you are reaching people with your love and changing lives. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.